Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. In less than a year, South Africans will celebrate 20 years of democracy. It's an incredibly important milestone for our country. An entire generation of South Africans will have grown up not knowing what it's like to live under apartheid era laws. But the question is, are they really free from the legacy of apartheid? A mere 10% of black South Africans have entered the middle class in South Africa. The rest, 90%, are split somewhere between the working poor and the masses of unemployed living in abject poverty. While white South Africans continue to enjoy the best privileges that this country can offer to those with economic security, a large number of black South Africans are still trapped within a system of economic apartheid. Our guest today argues that economic apartheid is allowed to be reproduced in post-apartheid South Africa because some of the biggest benefactors of apartheid have yet to be brought to book. We're talking to Marjorie Jobson, director of the Kulamani Support Group, an organization that was established to assist victims of apartheid, particularly in the area of reparations for apartheid crimes. Welcome to Saxis, Marjorie. Thank you, Fazila. Now, Marjorie, tell us a little bit about your work in trying to hold these corporations accountable for crimes that were committed 20 years ago during the apartheid era. You've brought a case against some of these companies in, American, in an American court. How far are you with that case? What's going on? The case is now known as the South Africa Apartheid Litigation. Um, it started 10 years ago, November 2002, um, when there was a huge silence in South Africa around keeping the promise that there would be a reparations program for victims identified by the Truth Commission. Um, the transition was characterized by three promises that there would be this conditional amnesty for perpetrators who disclosed the truth of their actions, um, that there would be the gift of, a tr of um, truth to society, and that there would be reparations and we've seen dismal failure on two of those counts. And when the human rights violations hearings closed at the end of 1998, there was a hiatus of silence around keeping promises to victims. And this is a challenge everywhere in, in models of transitional justice, which we are very critical of. Um, and we're trying to advocate for new approaches but um, so in that interim, um, one of the analyses we did was that corporations basically got away scot-free. Um, the corporations that came to the TRC business hearings, some 55 companies, argued that they themselves had been victims of apartheid and that it had been very difficult to run business operations under apartheid, whereas the truth was that actually they very much helped to shape um, you know, the formation of legislation and the refinement of legislation to protect them, to ensure that they actually made maximum profits operating during apartheid. And so uh, with partners mainly in Switzerland and in Germany from the anti-apartheid movement, we did a, a review of the companies that had exclusive contracts with the apartheid security machinery um, and to, to try and bring a case against those companies for aiding and abetting the perpetration of gross human rights violations and um, it's been a very interesting process. It began actually a lot of the thinking around uh, transnational corporate accountability actually even at the United Nations um, because it was very clear, you know, the United Nations General Assemblies had passed something like 40 resolutions about this crime of apartheid, and yet one of our arguments in our case was that apartheid was a crime against humanity, and the decision of the courts was that as there is no precedent for apartheid as a crime against humanity, you can't have that argument. So, you know, the, developing the jurisprudence around these issues is, is, a, is very, very tough, increasingly tough as the, um, with the backlash from the companies. Can um, you name some of the companies? Well, 
In the beginning there were 23 companies. It was all the oil companies who broke the oil embargoes against South Africa. We lost the oil companies, Chevron, Texaco, <laughs> actually BP, all of them. There were, it was quite a big um, group of companies that made huge profits from providing the oil that South Africa doesn't have and couldn't get if people respected the embargoes and which actually led to you know, all the investment in Sassel, um, with whom we are engaged at the moment in uh, trying to hold them accountable. But um, the oil companies, all the banks, um, especially the European banks and British banks, who, who gave the apartheid government the loans to make those purchases of weapons, ammunition, tanks, um, actually s specific software that was used by the military. And um, then it was the arms manufacturers and the people who built the military vehicles. So in the end it was 23 companies. We lost all the companies that apart from those exclusive contracts had um, general business dealings in the country. So it got whittled down to five companies. So who are these five companies? Five that companies that are General lived. Motors, yeah. Ford, Daimler, IBM and Rheinmetall. Rheinmetall is a Swiss armaments manufacturer that exported the very first arms manufacturing facility, like an entire factory they exported to South Africa and it initiated our own endogenous you know, weapons production which is now actually providing 12% of the GDP. So we've become a huge exporter of arms, sadly. But um, IBM, um, IBM's a very notorious case because IBM's track record is one of having created for the Nazi regime the punch card system which documented all the people who were put into concentration camps and who were exterminated in that sort of final solution, as it was called, which was run over three years in the end, the final three years from 42 to 45. And, um, and so they actually installed um, huge computer equipment in the basement of military headquarters in Pretoria. And they ran and they developed the software that ended up being used to racially class classify all South Africans. Um, very, I mean, it was the, the edge of innovation in, t in terms of the IT industry at the time. Very interesting what they were applying it to. So tell us, how far have you come in this 10-year case that you've been embroiled in? How close are the victims of apartheid um, to achieving um, reparations? The issue around the international lawsuit is to try and hold some companies accountable to invest in a, what we imagine being called an apartheid rehabilitation and reconciliation trust fund. Um, the principles of that trust fund are in place. Um, we received a small share contribution from General Motors and um, that will form like the seed funding of this trust fund. It is a, a very small seed grant that will eventually come into um, this trust fund, which we hope to supplement by um, sh naming and shaming more of these companies that have never come to the table. And because of our, ca our case um, against corporations, there is not a single South African or multinational company apart now from the General Motors donation, I should say, is um, that have ever supported programs of rehabilitation for victims of gross violations because they've been scared off by, you know, suing companies. Um, we, uh, when our case was filed, um, the South African government was called by Colin Powell at the time to advise the South African government that if they didn't want to lose foreign investment, they should write a letter to the court requesting the judge to dismiss the case. So, I mean, th this is the nature of this work, that there's always political interventions in these kinds of cases. 
um, the South African government, Penwell Medina, complied. Um, he wrote a very detailed nine-page submission on all the advances the government had made in water and electricity and housing. And he said, given our track record in those fields, uh, we should be trusted to do a reparations program for victims, which is still not materialized at this stage. And um, so the case was dismissed. Um, we took it on, a, on appeal. We won the appeal, it went back to the lower court. Um, the judge in the lower court had passed away and a very interesting uh, woman lawyer, Shira Scheindlin, who had done cases related to chemical and biological warfare and sort of mass damages claims in parts of the world. And she produced an extraordinary judgment that was um, very, very helpful. It set benchmarks around how this case in no way um, contravened any of the advances of the Truth Commission, that she did not feel it was her duty to consult the US government or the South African government because victims have a right to redress and having these kinds of cases heard. And, um, and she said she furthermore would like to appeal to companies to stop delaying the progress of this case by repeatedly appealing any advances. So it was a very significant 2009 judgment. Um, after that, just after she gave that judgment, the um, Minister Khadebe, the, who then had become Minister of Justice, um, he wrote a letter saying, um, the South African government would now like to see the case proceed. But it was, in a sense, um, we'd missed quite a lot of potential time for, for winning this before other issues and backlash emerged from the political lobbies in the United States on the justices in the Supreme Court of Appeal, justices who were appointed under George Bush. So um, and they brought a ruling about the statute that we used, um, that they're going to narrow the use of the statute by foreign claimants very dramatically. And so at the moment we have only two companies that we can legitimately name as American companies, um, IBM and Ford Motor Company. And so we've now ended up with only two remaining companies and our case is going to court on the 4th of June. So it's been a, a very interesting struggle, but it, it's something that I think has been a massive education for victims, um, for actually understanding what it means, what the right to redress means. It's written into international law, but it's very seldom um, implemented anywhere because when you are amongst the most poor or absolutely deliberately disempowered group of people, your voice is not taken seriously. Marjorie, when, when I talked to you before, you argued that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission resulted in amnesty for the perpetrators of apartheid crimes, but not justice for the victims of apartheid. Can you elaborate on that? The thing is what, that how do victims comprehend justice and um, for victims the first step is that there's acknowledgement of their contributions and of what the consequences of the stands are that they made. And that was the basis on which we've developed this huge archive of 85,000 individual stories and, and corroborating documents um, of, uh, you know, in, in recognition of people's contributions. The next thing is that um, the harms that people suffered just begin a kind of downward spiral in terms of your ability to have a life of survival, you know, not even of well-being, but just mere survival. And so um, people who have lost so much, I mean, breadwinners, education, land, um, any access to opportunities, need particular interventions and justice demands. If, I mean, what's very interesting to us is how the um, Navi Pillay, the, the 
Human Rights Commission at the, at the UN has become the strongest advocate for measures to rehabilitate people. It's not really rehabilitation, it's to facilitate that, you know, this downward spiral can actually be reversed and it's particularly women with all these responsibilities to sustaining families and husbands who go to work on the mine who suffer the most. And um, so that is a, you have to have specific programs and resources to, to even recover to where you were at the time that you made those stands. That has not been put in place in South Africa at all. And in fact, um, there's been messages of terrible contempt against people who are saying it will take resources to reverse the situation. And those resources are not yet um, available to um, survivors of these gross human rights violations. And then the other part of it is, um, you know, we say a consequence of doing those things could be reconciliation. But reconciliation isn't this the cheap thing it was made at the Truth Commission where victims were acclaimed for their willingness to embrace perpetrators. And we, we felt that was an appalling thing to promote in this country. It was a shallow uh, process of, um, yes, people, um, people's willingness to engage the humanity of people who harmed them, but, but beyond that it, it, it demands uh, some kind of more generous response from those perpetrators, and that has not been forthcoming, still even today. I'm particularly interested in hearing about the link you've made between the lack of corporate accountability for apartheid crimes leading to apartheid conditions reproducing themselves in certain sectors of the South African economy today. Um, for example, in the mining sector. Um, you know, you've linked the strife in Marikana today to the fact that mining companies were allowed to wipe the slate clean in the new South Africa. They were never held to account for the damage that they'd done in the past. So they simply continue damaging people in the new South Africa. Can you talk a little bit about that? The sad thing is that 20 years after the transition, the mining industry looks exactly as it did under apartheid. Um, the 90% of the workers on mines are migrant workers who have families living in very difficult conditions in mine worker sending areas. And w w we've had post-apartheid, we've had all sorts of legislation created around um, what is meant to happen to transform the mining industry, but the mining companies have found every loophole to avoid making the necessary changes. And so Marikana was a culmination of, of, of how untenable conditions are. I mean, they've actually worsened. Um, so if we're going to see this Marikana massacre as, as a watershed for the mining industry, um, it is going to take very interesting ch changes. And for us, it's about the, the fact that the voices of the women who send their husbands off to work in the mines have to start being heard on the national agenda. So we've been working with women in those situations. We're busy in a process of developing a submission for the Chamber of Mines on trying to force mining companies to actually begin to invest in mine worker sending areas because families are locked into the situation generation after generation of having no option but to send their strongest, fittest men largely off to these mines. And so, you know, we find that um, the way Kulumani operates is we get requests from all over the country to please come, we want to join Kulumani because <laughs> it's not it's no longer just about apartheid violations, it's about continuing violations. And there, there are very few points at which people who are very poor in rural areas have access to any kind of support or capacity building or legal redress. And, um, and so, I mean, our, Kulumani's role has, has really um, used what we've learnt about growing these capacities in people to deal with 
post-apartheid violations, which are no less severe than they were under apartheid. People don't know how to begin to make stands against these powerful companies that are are actually in relationships with governments and the governments are benefiting. So we have a huge job in terms of building people's capacity to refuse to be exploited by multinationals largely. South Africa is also by South African companies. Can you talk to us a little bit about any efforts to invest in these sender communities, either by government or the mining companies? There have been no efforts yet. One of the things that Lonman did early on when this Marikana Commission was established, and we think it was like very much a publicity effort, was that they declared they would set up a, a trust fund and they would educate all the children of the mine workers who'd been killed by the police. And so what they did was to send officials from Teba. Now, Teba has been in place since apartheid. Uh, uh, Teba stands for the Employment Bureau of Africa, and all mine workers in this subcontinent are employed through signing up with Teba offices, which you can find in all these rural areas in Lesotho and Mozambique and other countries, Malawi and Zambia. And, um, and so the Teba officials arrived at the doorsteps of the widows and said, well, we've been told to come and tell you that Lanman is going to take all your children and put them in a boarding school in Gauteng and they will pay for all their education until matric and they will give them one school uniform a year. And the widow said, what? I mean, who are you to decide what will happen to our children? I mean, we haven't been consulted. Um, our husbands were fighting for Lonman management to speak to them directly, and we demand the same. Thank you very much for joining us at Saxis. And thank you very much to our listeners and viewers for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service. If you'd like more social justice analysis, you can visit our website at www.saxis.org.za.